Customer service done right can be your company's single biggest competitive advantage. Welcome to the customer service revolution. Join customer service authority and best-selling author John DeJulius as he interviews leaders who are revolutionizing their industries. This is more than a podcast, though. It's a movement. The customer service revolution is a radical overthrow of conventional business mentality designed to transform what customers and employees experience. If you're a revolutionary customer service leader who's ready to stop competing on price and obsessed with building a brand that people cannot live without, this podcast is for you. Welcome to the Customer Service Revolution podcast with John DeJulius. This week, John's excited to bring you Matthew Dixon, Matthew's bestseller, The Challenger Sale has hit number one on Amazon and the Wall Street Journal. It's sold nearly a million copies so far and has been translated into a dozen different languages. So why is it so wildly popular? Well, it contains one of the most important advances in selling in many years. Listen in and find out what that is and what's meant by Challenger Sale. You may be forever changed in the way you think about selling. Now here's your host, John DeJulius. Hello, revolutionaries, and welcome to another episode of the Customer Service Revolution Podcast. This is John DeJulius, Chief Revolution Officer of the DeJulius Group, and I'm so excited to have a unbelievable author, consultant, speaker on this week's episode, Mr. Matthew Dixon. Welcome, Matt. Thanks, John. It's great to see you again. It's great to uh, great to talk to you again, and uh, it's been a long time. I think last time. We were together at Comcast. Remember, we had the uh, yeah the call leaders group there, and uh, that was uh, that was a fun time. But it's been a long time. A lot has happened since then. A lot <laughs> has happened in, in, <laughs> in life and in in our industries and all that. So, man, I want to tell you the, the story. So, I'm a big fan and and love your stuff. And obviously, I was most familiar with your best selling book, The Effortless Experience, and just got so many golden nuggets and shared it with our clients and have told them to you know, make sure that's part of their, what we call a return on experience dashboard. And yeah. I love that. Didn't know about the challenger sale, which is taking control of the customer conversation, which was, it was a number one Amazon and Wall Street Journal bestseller. I got all these accolades. But this, uh, and here's a, a confession. Well, like you, I consume so many books a yeah. year. It wasn't until reading the uh, challenger sale that I realized I have never read a sales book in my life. Really? No way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and I've like, you know, I, I've always kind of been anti-sales. I, you know, can't sell. And, and, and all our business models, I'm sure like you, it was all incoming, yeah. right? They read my book, saw me speak, referred, yeah. you repeat business. So we never really had to create that. And so, you know, right or wrong, I, I didn't realize that until I was reading your book and I, I couldn't, Put it down, but this is how it came across. So in 2020, we all had the pandemic, and we had to find something to do with our our, our free time. You watched all of Netflix. You made yeah. your sourdough bread, and then you're uh, like okay, Breaking Bad, like and you know all those, yeah, Ozark yeah. and everything. And so we always wanted to. Are you familiar with like EOS? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So for our listeners, EOS is a, a great coaching model for business systems, and so we had an EOS implementer. And he'd always says, you need to do a kind of an EOS in customer experience and license coaches with your methodology. I go, I know, I love that idea. You know, no time, right? They want to do it right. It's a big undertaking and kept on saying next year, next year, next year. And then March, 2020K. And you had a lot of time on your hands. <laughs> yeah, a lot of time. So we dedicated all of 2020 with launching the, what we call this CX coaching customer experience coaching, where we, uh, you know, license our methodology. Yep. And, and, and so 2021, we kicked it off and, you know, we, we got 15 coaches quarter one and, and kept on adding coaches. But what was unique about the model, like EO, EOS is, you know, these coaches that we had to license, they had to go out and hunt and find their own clients. Yep. So a couple of things to that is, we didn't have that experience to say, all right, well, this is how you build a pipeline. And, you know, that was unique to us. So we started bringing on, you know, people from EOS and, and, and yeah. scaling up and other models who were really good at this. 
to uh, teach them how to build the pipeline. And so one of uh, Andy uh, Bailey from Petra Coaching, he was on there and he was saying, you know, you, you got to read the challenger sale. And he told all our coaches. And so I went and got it and was just going to thumb through it and just make sure that it was something we wanted to get all our coaches in and kind of make it their primary train. And yeah. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, oh my God, my buddy, Matt Dixon wrote this. You know, I'm, the like, same yeah. guy. <laughs> I'm like, God, the guy, you know, I only can talk about one subject. I was like, so jealous that, you know, you are wide and you, you have multiple expertise. I've gotten wider over the holidays with all the cookies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I started reading it and, and, and Matt, I, I couldn't put it down. I highlighted everything. And I immediately sent it to everyone in the Julius group from marketing, yep. sales, and all my consultants and said, you have to read this. And so, it, 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 and we're not a sales company. We don't teach yep. sales, but everything, you know, and, and I'll quote so many and, and ask you, but it was just like, I love it. Now our coaches have to read it. And I just really like it. So I'm going to start with, to me, the most generic, primitive concept I get from it when I tell people, because I tell people to read, you know, read it all the time. And then you can clean it up and fix it. But the <laughs> challenge you're selling to me is, and I know it's, it's really it's for professional services, B2B, business to business, you know, and sales solution. But the way I, I like to think of it is if I call someone and say, hey, listen, do you sell a hammer? Yes, we do. Do you sell nails? Yes, we do. Do you sell two by four? Yes, we do. Great. And then they're excited. Maybe I ask what price and then we hang up. You know, and we used to think that was the best thing. Right. The three things you're asking for are the three things we have. And I can tell you how to get them. And, and we think, oh my God, it's a match made in heaven. And they're going to be rushing in here tomorrow or today or go online right? But that's not what's going to happen, right? They're also going to call five other people, five other hardware stores. And again, I know this is the worst metaphor, but it, you know, because it's really not for hardware stores, but, and they're all going to say, yes, we sell a hammer, we sell nails, we sell two by fours. And that's what really like, you know, the challenge is that's not what you want. You don't want to say yes, yes, yes. And, you know, it's a perfect match made in heaven, hang up and hope that they're going to buy. Yeah. How is that a, a, as a metaphor? Did I just bastardize your whole? Are no, you, no, you know, your it's, stomach? It, no, it's just for, you know, when I think about what you said, John, and think about the history of sales and how it's evolved, I think you're quite right. And, you know, it's unfortunate because a lot of people still sell exactly that way, right? They, it's, I call it, it's kind of, I don't do this in the book, but when I'm presenting this on stage, I call it kind of the, you'll show up and throw up uh, approach, which is, let me tell you all about my hammers. Let me tell you all about my two by fours. Let me tell you all about my nails. It's our nails are are longer. They're harder. They're like they're more rust resistant than our you know the competitors' nails. That's the really old school what I call kind of product selling. But what's interesting is the world kind of evolved into what was known as kind of solution selling needs diagnosis based on. So the belief was we don't want to go in and sell products. We want to sell a solution. And if you're going to sell a solution. You've got to go in and understand the customer's needs. And so in that world, using your same metaphor, you know, you would go in and say, you know, boy, John, what's keeping you up at night? Oh, you're trying to build a shed in your backyard. Okay, great. Right. And you first say, well, wait a minute. Yes, we have those. But what do you need them for? Exactly. Right. Exactly. And then find out, hey, you, you might not even need those. Or before you get those and all of a sudden, you know, you got the person's head spinning in a good way because no one's taught them that. And you just saved them a boatload of money or time or. So sorry to, to cut you no, off. You're, you're, you're right. So um, so that that idea is like, hey, I don't, you know, I want to try to get you to say something to articulate a problem or a challenge. And then I can say, boy, our, our, we've got the solution for you, John. Where we're evolving to, you know, that that was a fine approach up until the point where customers realized they didn't really need to have those kinds of conversations with, with salespeople. You know, it's funny. There's a data point when we wrote the challenger sale. It was written in like, we did the research in like 2008. And the, the problem we we're trying to address was, there's a really tough time to be selling, but some salespeople seem to be figuring it out. What are those salespeople doing differently? What we realized after we wrote the book, after we did more research is that this isn't a story about selling in a downturn. This is a story about selling to a customer who has all the information in the world at their fingertips. And what happens in that world is that the customer doesn't really need you anymore to show up and throw up and talk about your stuff because it's all on your website. They don't need you to come in and ask them questions like that. They're diagnosing their own needs. They're trying to figure it out on their own. Then they kind of create their short list and then they call you. 
And what happens is all the, the customer makes all these assumptions about what they need, who you are, how you compare to your competitors, your features and benefits compared to your competitors' features and benefits. They put it all in an RFP, and then they send it out to the short list of vendors who made the cut, and they ask you all to compete on price. Now, for a salesperson, that's a really tough place to be. And Challenger was a story about, like, what do we do in that world? Because all this solution selling and needs diagnosis stuff, a lot of that stuff came up before the internet even existed. And it hadn't really evolved very much since then. But, you know, it had evolved was the way that customers were buying. They became way more sophisticated. You know, procurement departments became way more sophisticated. The data sets they have access to, think about like LinkedIn didn't exist. We think about your business or my business. Now our potential customers can talk amongst themselves about us and, and compare notes about their experiences with us. And you know what? You shouldn't hire Matt Dixon. You should go hire these other guys that do much better work. You know, that's the kind of stuff that customers are sharing on their own. And then again, they create that short list and then they force you and me and, our, and the short list of vendors to compete on price. And that's just a really awful place for the salesperson to be. So I think in some respects, like as you're saying, it's a great metaphor, you know, the hammer, the nails, the two by fours. The selling has evolved, but I think what's the reason it's evolved is because customers are buying differently than the way they used to. And I think it was only that moment in 2008 where we kind of applied data to it and said, went out and studied and we said, huh, something's not right here because the people who are selling really effectively today aren't doing the stuff that's been taught for the past 20 or 30 years. They're doing something different. Or in many respects, they're doing that, but they're also doing something else and that's something else was challenger and we you know we gave a name to it and told that story and and i think it it spoke to people because they themselves seen that boy this way i learned how to sell 20 years ago it's not generating the returns it once did you know so that's that's kind of where we where we ended up but i i like the metaphor I'm probably going to steal it next time I'm please please i i was afraid i i was you know diminish it but it just was so basic and i've had my own sales rep say oh my god i had the greatest call in the world they were looking for this, this, and this, and you know they want exactly what we do. Yep. And then we wouldn't get them, and but they were convinced that oh my god we were you know soulmates from you know what they're looking for what we do. And so what I'm going to ask you about is how. Listen, our biggest thing that the Julius Group and the customer service revolution we say we do or help our clients do, and you just said it is help make price irrelevant. Yep. And if I'm shopping you. And everything looks, you know, like the same. That's really hard to do. And typically people, sales reps have to resort to making better deals. And we absolutely don't want that. But your challenger sale approach distinguishes us or the person that rep in that company in, oh my God, I can't afford to go elsewhere. I can't afford to pay less because it's going to cost me more. So um, I know you came up with, your research found five types uh-huh. of sales reps. You want to yeah. go over those real quick? Sure. Yeah, yeah. So five types of reps. I'll kind of go through them and tell you who they are real quick. And then we can talk a little bit more about the challenger. So the five types of reps. So we did a global study just to give listeners a background. When we wrote the book, it was off a data set of 6,000 salespeople, all B2B salespeople around the world, different industries, different geographies and markets, slow growth companies, fast growth companies, you name it. In the years since the book has uh, been written, we've continued to run the analysis. And I think the last count, we have data on about a quarter million B2B salespeople. And the story that it's changed a little bit at the margins, but the story that's in the book is still the story that comes out of the data today. It's got a lot of staying power. It hasn't really changed a whole lot in the 10 years since the book came out. But when we first ran the analysis, we found that we collected all this data on salespeople. And we found that they basically fall into five different what you call profiles, or we call it maybe the five approaches to sales. The first one is the hard worker. So the hard worker is the person who gets in early, stays late. They reach out to more prospective clients, respond to more LinkedIn messages, maybe more RFPs than anybody else on the team. You know, sales managers love these people because you never have to worry about their activity levels. They're really busy. The mindset around sales is that, you know, sales is like a numbers game. As long as I have enough opportunities in the top of the pipeline and I follow the sales process, I'm going to hit my objectives at the end of the quarter, the end of the year. So they think of sales as almost like managing a factory floor in their world. Um, the second one was a challenger. And uh, again, listeners hope they act surprised when I tell them the challenger wins in a minute. But uh, but the challenger is, think of them as like the debater on the team. They've got a, a unique point of view and they are always looking. I sometimes say to get in a debate with the customer, but what they're really trying to do is get the customer to think differently, get them to think outside their comfort zone, to break their mental model. So they've got this point of view. It's often provocative. It 
it creates kind of consternation and uh, it grabs the customer by their lapels and shakes them out of their comfort zone. It, well, remember- it's a, to me, it's a holy shit moment because it's not the typical right. conversation <laughs> I've had where everyone's agreeing. We tell me, yeah, yeah, we could do that for you. We could do that for you. you know, okay. you're, ch- you're challenging me. That's Why right. do you think that hypothesis is not correct? That will not solve your problem. That's right. It's like, what and are you, you talking know what about? That, that you trying to lose this sale? Like, you yeah. know, like, that's what I love about it. And, you know, it's so funny because business owners and builders like yourself, I think they see themselves in, in the challenger because that's yeah. how you built the business, right? You, you had to, to make, you know, customer service revolution a name in the business and become a recognized brand and to get your first few clients. Like when you're doing business or, or competing against all these better known brands, that, like you got to be a challenger. And so I think entrepreneurs especially see themselves in that. And I think what frustrates them oftentimes is that as they they bring on more consultants, more salespeople, why don't they sell the way I did back when I was fighting tooth and nail to, to create a name for the DeJulius group or for our product, for our solution? Now, what's interesting is I think in some organizations, especially big organizations, those challengers can be a little bit of a tough cultural fit. I, I remember years ago presenting this in a, a room full of chief sales officers and I got to the point, we'll get to it in a moment, about how the challenger does compared to the other four profiles. And there's this guy sitting right up front, uh, this guy, Bob, and he's, he kind of put his head in his hands and he's shaking his head. And it's, and it was very distracting. Yeah, that does, that does wonders yeah. for our uh, self-esteem on stage. <laughs> I was like, this isn't good. Either he disagrees violently or he's right. just mad. I don't know. So I stopped the meeting. I said, Bob, you don't seem to buy it. What's going on? This, you know, I think uh, this should be good news for us. And he said, you don't understand. I fired all those guys like five years ago. They're such a pain. <laughs> And so, you know, and again, like some companies, it's not disagreement and pushing people outside their comfort zone is not really appreciated. So it's a, it can be a tough cultural fit. The third one is relationship builder. Now the relationship builder. Which I, you know, I would have thought, and my last book's called The Relationship Economy, that knowing that you're from the East Coast and you have four children and your fandom is the the Jets and and the Mets. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, That that would... You didn't have to share that I'm a Mets and Jets fan on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's not so smart, John. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, so why? Yeah. Why isn't that naturally, you know, that's the one I would have thought would have been the winner. Hey, you're you're right. So let, we'll go to that in just a moment. Let me, I'm going to go through the five and then I'm going to yeah. answer your question next. So the, the relationship builder, I want to be careful because I think sometimes people get this like madman image of the relationships. Oh, it's the five martini lunch. It's the luxury box at the game. It's the round right. of golf. And sure, you know, some of that stuff happens in, in professional sales still. But we're talking about the salesperson whose job, the relationship builder, they see it as their job to understand what the customer needs and deliver against those needs. So my job is to ask you, John, as a customer, what's keeping you up at night? What are, what are the things you're really looking for? How can we help you? And whatever you say, my job is to make it happen. You know, yep. if you need a discount, I'm going to make it happen. If you need right. some solution that my company's never delivered for them, and the product guys are going to hate my guts when I sell this, I don't care. I'm doing it for you because you're the customer. Customer's always right. So that's kind of the relationship builder's mindset. And then the last two were the lone wolf. The lone wolf is like the prima donna of the sales organization. They don't put anything in the CRM system. They don't use the marketing materials you put in their hands. They sell stuff you don't even make. And then they ask for, you know, <laughs> they ask for forgiveness and not for permission. And a lot, except the only place you don't see those is regulated businesses. But everywhere else, you see a lot of lone wolves. And oftentimes, sales managers let them get away with it because they're, you know, they're killing their number. Rainmakers. The rainmakers. It's the ones, it's the lone wolves who miss their number who are told to get back in line or they're shown the, the exits. Right. And then the last one is sort of the problem solver. You know, the problem solver is interesting because there's some tie in here with customer service. That person is really more of a customer service person, but they have the job. They they wear the uniform of a salesperson. So their heart is more in making sure the customer gets what they bought, that the implementation goes well, that you know, it, you're know you hitting all the success metrics. And any problem that comes up, they dive on the grenade. Now, we love that in our customer service people, but we want our salespeople focused on selling. You want to hand it off to the, the delivery team, right? So those are the five types of salespeople. And as you know, from the title of the book, the challenger outperforms all four. It would be a bad title of the book if the challenger sale didn't. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> so, but, so you look at this and you um, you look at this when you, you overlay with performance data. What you find is two things. One, challengers dominate when you look at high performers. The top 20% of, of salespeople, almost 40% of them fall into the challenger profile. Only 7% of them fall into that relationship builder profile. And that you put your finger on exactly the rub in the book, which is almost everybody would have bet on the relationship builder. 
Because that person, they're a people person. They sit on the customer side of the table. They try to understand what the customer needs. They deliver against what needs. Those needs, they, they do exactly what salespeople have been taught to do for 20, 30 years now. And they finish dead last when you look at high performers. And so I, I think a lot of people were less surprised that the challenger wins and more surprised that the profile they, they thought would be the winner came in so far behind. And, you know, if I were to sum up the, the real difference between the two is that, you know, look, challengers we know in the data are... Uh, they actually are very good at relationship building. In fact, they're the second best relationship builders. Think of them as like, they go to sales university or sales college, they major in challenging, but they have a minor in relationship building. So having a great relationship, building a great relationship, um, and occasionally doing what your customer needs you to do is very important. And the, the challenger knows, if I don't have a good relationship, I'll never get an opportunity to be invited in the customer's office or get on a Zoom call so that I can challenge them. But the relationship builders approach is, as long as I know their kids' names, I do whatever they want, and I'm reactive and responsive and nice, I ask how high when they ask me to jump, they're going to keep buying from me and buy more and, and say great things about me. But the challenger understands that in a world where customers can learn on their own, that you're this close to being put out to bid for somebody cheaper or some upstart competitor, just being likable and generous and responsive isn't enough. you got to bring new ideas to the table. So what the challenger does is they build a relationship, but it's a relationship built on business value. So what we like to say is they deliver a sales conversation that your customer would pay for. I mean, think about that, that. That's what was my next thing. I love that, that the customer would be willing to pay for that call just we just had, yeah. right? Yeah. Like if I, if I don't do anything more, I'm so much smarter. I'm going to look better to my boss Oh yeah. and be yeah. able to bring a wealth of knowledge is, you know, that, that might not be the course we want to go down. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's interesting because you think about that and it's and we're not talking about it's, it's interesting because we're not sometimes people think, OK, but we don't want to be free consultants or we want to give away everything and have the customer not buy from us. But what's interesting about what the challenger does and we talk about a lot of the book is about how the challenger conversation flows. Right. And what they're trying to do is create a problem, not ask the customer what the problem is. So they're less focused on asking the customer hey, what's keeping you up at night, which is the question like all salespeople use right. every day of the week and twice on Sunday. What they're more focused on is uh, when I sit down with you, I'm going to show you the thing that should be keeping you up at night. And that's going to cause some consternation on your part. And it's going to make you fur your brow and you're going to call BS and you're going to ask me to prove it. And I'm going to make you believe it. And then it's going to lead directly to the product I want to sell to you. So it's we call it a commercial insight, not any kind of insight. It's insight designed to sell the thing I'm trying to sell you. But I, what I need to do is get you to see that there's an opportunity out there that no, that you didn't know about. I made you believe it by showing you the data. I made you personally care about it. And we are the only company that can help you solve it. And then you're in a category of one. And then suddenly you're where you were talking about, John, you're, you're, you have the permission to charge a premium for what you do because nobody else in the world of, in your case, customer service consulting can do this. And I love that. It, it's it. not asking the client, potential client, what keeps them up at night. It's you telling them what should be keeping up at night there's an Uber coming to your industry or, or whatever it may be, yeah. and you aren't aware of it yet. I love that. If you are a listener who is not in sales like me, we're going to get to it. I have changed the way I present, the way I write, our marketing on our websites, our proposals. Literally, right, right before our podcast, I just had a CEO call. So I know you, you know what this is like, but our consulting projects. Once a quarter, I'll have a call with the CEO to make yep. sure he or she's liking what they're hearing from their CXO or project lead and what I'm hearing from our consultant. And I use this, right? You know, I started giving them more things that they should be, you know, are you concerned at all about this? Or have you thought about this? And it was shocking and impressive yep. that these are things that he didn't have on his radar yet. I love the... Uh, what I call the three T's of a challenger. So you want to explain what those three yeah. things are? So three skills of the challenger we found, the things they do uniquely, the first thing is they teach the customer something new. So that was exactly what we were just talking about, but they bring that new idea. And you know, when you're doing it right, when you think you're presenting something insightful, and if your customer, every customer you talk call on is like agreeing with you and like, oh, John, you're very, very smart. Love the Julius group. You guys are wonderful. Right. I know your stuff. You haven't said anything that really insightful, right? Because in an insight, we all want to be seen as thought leaders. And we talk about, you know, you and I are, you know, people, we got to invite that Comcast thing because we're thought leaders, right? But I think what we really aspire to is not to just be seen as smart, but to be seen as people who present frame-breaking ideas that get people to think differently. 
And that's what a challenger really aspires to. Because So what they're looking for in that moment of teaching, the first T, is that the customer's like, whoa, hold on a second. I've never heard that before. You must be off your rocker. Like you gotta, you better be able to back Clarify that. that. Hold on, hold on. Yeah, hold on a second. And and I think that's the moment where you know you're doing it right. The second thing is they tailor. So that's the second T. In, in B2B especially, and we're selling complex solutions. So you think about you guys selling an engagement to a client and it's got a lot of elements to it and it's expensive and it's risky and it's disruptive. The way the client responds is they bring more and more people to the table who all want to speak into that proposal, right? They, you got like cats, dogs, and bicycles showing up at the, at the buying committee. And so what the challenger is really good at is how do I tailor my message? First of all, how do I find the right person to hitch my wagon to? Because there's going to be one of those people who's going to be more important than the rest in terms of building consensus and then, and we wrote actually a follow-up book about that called the Challenger Customer, specifically about that problem of building consensus. But a lot of tailoring is, look, if one person at the table is in finance, another person's in running the call center, another person's running field service, another person's running product, like they're going to see the opportunities we're bringing. You're gonna, they're going to look at this proposal in many different ways. And so we got to make sure this insight is tailored to that person, into their job, into what matters to them. And the last one, this is the one we get the most pushback on is uh, taking control. So they take control. And I think when people hear challenger, they hear take control of the customer conversation, their mind immediately goes to like um, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, right. Wolf of right. Wall Street, and all this stuff, right? Right. Always be closing. Always be closing, right? All these, these images that give salespeople kind of a, a bad yes. reputation in the market. But what I'm always very careful to point out is taking control is not about being rude or aggressive or obnoxious. That is a sixth profile I'd call the jerk. That's not what we're talking about here. <laughs> we're, ta- we're talking about somebody who is very empathetic, who is deeply professional, who understands the customer, but you know they hold their ground and they do it. When I bring that big provocative idea and the customer says, ah, you don't understand our company, that doesn't apply, they hold their ground. They hold their ground when the customer says, hey, this looks great, John, but you know you got to bring the price down by 10%. Well, let's let's get the conversation back to value, right? They hold their ground. Want to improve your company culture and become the brand your employees and customers can't live without? Email Claudia at the DeJuliusGroup.com to find out about consulting, executive and online training, and other resources we can offer you. You can also schedule a call with Claudia by going to tdg.click forward slash Claudia. One of my favorite examples, tell you a real quick story of taking control, because I think this really il- illustrates how it's not about being a jerk. It's about being professional, but but holding your ground. There's a big company. I know a lot of a lot of your listeners are probably in businesses where they sell a lot through RFPs, you know, structured purchasing processes. There's a, cus- a customer we worked with a number of years ago in the industrial gases business. So they sell a lot of bottled like nitrogen and oxygen and you know CO2 to hospitals and, and you know manufacturing plants and chemicals companies, stuff like that. They were chasing a big hospital for years and years and years. And these guys were in bed with their biggest competitor. And then one day they got a phone call. The hospital decided to put that part of their supply chain out to bid. And they said, hey, come on in. We're going to send you the RFP, give you an hour in front of the buying committee. It's down to you guys, the current supplier. And we're going to invite a, like a local kind of mom and pop outfit to be inclusive and support a local business. We know they had no shot of winning the deal. It was a big hospital. So we're going to invite you all in. You have an hour next Friday. Come on in. Give it your best shot. And what's interesting is the head of sales, when he told me the story, he said, you know, my average salesperson, if they got that phone call from one of these customers we've been chasing for years, who's been in bed with our biggest competitor for like decades, and now suddenly they want to talk to us, they would have been like fist pumping and like, this is awesome. But he said, the customer ended up calling one of my challenger salespeople. And the challenger salesperson, he said, in this case, knew the only reason I'm getting it called in a week before the buying committee's meeting is the customer has no intention of switching. They're just trying to go through this song and dance to put pressure on the incumbent supplier. Right. right? They, the, they were column fodder, basically. So he went into the meeting. He did something. I th- I love this story. He goes in the meeting, get, takes his hour. He's not going to say no to the meeting. Goes in the meeting. And his company had produced a beautiful response to the RFP, spiral bound, like laser color copy thing. It was like 300 box of copy, hands it out to the buying committee. It's like 20 executives, the chief medical officer, the CFO, the head of supply chain, head of procurement, all sitting around the table, hands it out. And people start flipping through it, as you would imagine, because it looks impressive. And right. you know, they want to get, get the show on the road. And the salesperson says, you know what? We're not going to talk about that uh, today. In fact, put it back in your bag, slide it to the middle of the table. That's not what we're here to talk about. And the head of procurement who's running the buying committee says, well, what are you here to talk about? Because this is what we want to hear. He goes, let me jump to the punchline. 
we can do what you want at a great price and we can do it better than the guys you currently work with. But that's not what I want to talk to you about because you only have a, gave me an hour. What I'd rather talk to you about is the three things that my company was so surprised you guys didn't ask for in the RFP and mm-hmm. why we think those things are so important to accomplishing the objectives you said are mission critical for your hospital. Over the course of the next hour, introduce new criteria that just broke their mental model. They'd made all these assumptions about what they thought they needed, but they didn't consider these other things. At the end of the process, they listened to the other two suppliers politely. At the end of the process, the head of procurement says, you know what? I think we need to start over. Let's go back, redraw the RFP. They included those three things that that, that challenger sales person put on the table, made everyone go through the process again, and that company ended up winning the deal. They came in as a dark horse and they left as the winner. Now, I'm not saying you should always do that in an RFP situation, but I like it because it's a good example of being respectful and professional and assertive, but do it, you know, doing it in the right way, not being a jerk or rude or aggressive or obnoxious. No, I love this. And you you articulate very well that teach, tailor, and take control is not my way of the highway, but it's like we have to be willing to have companies walk away from us. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, if I'm selling you what you want, but in 12 or 18 months, your business is no better, no different. If, if yeah. your employee service aptitude is still low, right, yeah. we look bad. So if you're, you know, telling me you need this and we could do that. But listen, at the end of the day, Matt, your customer service is going to be no better in 12. I'm not putting my name on that. Yeah. Now, here's what you really need, Matt, is this type of training with this type. And. Are you, obviously, I'm going specific to the DeJulius group, but yeah, we can come in and trade all your new employees, but you also told me, or all your existing employees, but you also told me that you have, you know, 50% turnover a year. Yep. So where are you going to be at in a year if you don't add this training to your new employee orientation, right? Yeah. Yeah. And if, if someone walks away, that's okay, because I don't want that on my resume. You know, that, that is a great example of uh, taking control, John, is it's not just about negotiation in the final mile. And I think sometimes people think of it that way. It is about things like you're saying, disqualifying a bad fit customer really early on. Like, hey, custom, when, we, when we're successful and we deliver the right impact, it's, it's in this way. What you're asking for is not going to deliver the impact. It's not going to be great work for us. It's not going to be great spending your time. So I think we just shake hands, send each other LinkedIn invites and just be friends, you know, but that takes a lot of guts for a salesperson to do that. And really, we find only challenger salespeople will be do that kind of aggressive disqualification up front. They don't chase garbage trucks, right? And they don't want to be associated with those kind of opportunities. Right. And I have so many great quotes, you know, you know, in your book, you know, you want to take the customer on a, a roller coaster, right? And when they're done, they're sick to their stomach of the money they could be wasting, the money they're leaving on the table at risk, you know, all those things. And so, you know, I think you talk about leading at first, taking to a dark place, right? We need to create the antagonist. Who's the the villain in this? And I I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, your company, the the sales rep company isn't the hero. The methodology solution is that, oh, by the way, we just happen to be the best at delivering that solution. So we were creating your creating a fire, which is very painful for the customer, right? They see this, their house is on fire. And it just so happens, we are the only ones who sell the fire extinguisher that can put out that kind of fire. You know? right. So happy coincidence. But it's not your, your, your point is right. You know, none of that conversation is about the supplier. It's not about the vendor. And I think that's what a lot of companies get wrong. What we say in the book is they lead with their- Well, that was my next point that really pissed me off in the book <laughs> is, you know, and I'm going to let you explain it, but- yeah, I went to our website after reading this section, went to our proposal and the first five slides in the <laughs> Julius group. The you went world like, pulled all the cords out of the wall. And yeah, <laughs> and here's all the customers we've worked with and here's all the testimonials <laughs> and all this. And then, you know, maybe by slide 15 or 25 versus let's yeah. talk about what you explain, which, which I absolutely love. Yeah. Open it's, with- By the way, you- it's you guys and like everyone else in the world. And I think they're, you know, while the book has been out for 10 years and a lot of people have consumed it, I, I see a lot of sales pitch decks. I look at a lot of collateral on vendor websites. I look a lot at a lot of the content people are putting out there and the message hasn't really sunk through for a lot of organizations. So I think there's still quite a lot of like, let's talk about us. You know, we, I make a joke when I present this, that 
you know, no matter what audience I'm presenting to say, I can guess what the first four slides are in your slide deck. Yep. The first one is your mission and values, you know, you're customer centric, you're entrepreneurial, you're innovative, you're socially responsible. Second page is the, the logos of your best known products and solutions. The third page is the logos of your biggest customers. And the fourth page is a map that shows how many offices you have and it shows how old you are. And everyone's like squirming. And I said, look, it, I'm not going to tell you that stuff doesn't matter. It, it does, but it's all about you. It's not about the customer. Put it at the end. And right. here's the thing. You got to give, yeah, I got to ask two questions about that stuff. One, is it really unique? And I think a lot of times in business, we tend to fall into this mode of, you know, we're the leading global solution provider of fill in the blank. We actually did a separate site. It's not in the book. We found that 80% of vendors in every industry describe themselves as the leading global solution provider of their industry, which by definition can't be true, but we all talk about ourselves in the same ways. And we talk about the same values and the same missions, and it just kind of all sounds the same. I was at um, the customer contact week recently and I was talking to a vendor there and he said, you know, it's funny. I walk around the vendor hall and you could take this signage and put it on any vendor solution. It all sounds the same, right? All AI this and, you know, agents that and quality this and productivity that and it's all the same. It's interesting. We really got to ask the tough question of, and we call this in the book, the Deb Oler question because it's named after a woman, Deb Oler, just retired from Granger, but she ran sales and marketing for Granger. And she came up with this question that started their challenger journey, which is, uh, John, the question was, why should our customers buy from us instead of our competitors? It's not because you're more customer centric. If that may be true, but that's really hard to quantify. It's really hard to prove. But what is the thing you make? What's the thing you deliver or the way you deliver it that is fundamentally unique? It's nothing your competitors can touch with a barge pole. And then the second question is, what would have to be true for the customer to want to pay for that unique capability? And then once you figure that out, that unique capability goes at the very, very end. Because you got it, the whole story, that roller coaster you talked about, it's all about getting the customer to see the opportunity, to see the problem, to get that, oh boy, my house is on fire and backing it up and making them care about it and say, well, what would it mean for your business if we could solve that? Not with our solution, but just in general, if we make that problem go away, boy, it'd be millions of dollars, John. It would be more upsell and cross-sell, be more customer loyalty, be great, you know, put our competitors out of business, be awesome. Well, turns out we're the company that can help you do that. In fact, we're the only ones out there. You know, let me tell you more about us. Let me tell you more about our products. And that at that point, the customer cares. But if you lead with that, you haven't given them a reason to care. And you got it. So again, you got to lead to don't lead with. No, I love that. And, you know, and, and, and I, I didn't want to say this because I'm going to owe you a commission on this. But when I was in the middle of reading this, we were pitching a big a national bank. Yep. Locations in, in over 30 states in the U.S. And, you know, I, I did that. I blew up our, our pitch deck. They wanted me on the call. And for a call, I, you know, a proposal like that, I'll be on that call. And. I did exactly that. And I opened with, it, it was verbiage from your book. Here's from working with multi-unit brands and in the financial industries, two separate, but combined. And I listed all the things that perk up as a result of having locations all over the world and acquisition of brands, right? Yeah. Now you have a melting pot of culture. I bought your brand and you know, they were all into, you know, this, and now we want them into us. And I explained all that. And then down at the bottom, which again, just like you said, was the first five slides was, oh, by the way, the De Julius Group is, we have written, and, yeah. and I use this the same example, even for uh, intros for, for, as a speaker, right? And you get these intros and they're like six pages long and they want you to read everything. And, and, and I say this too, and someone says, what, what do you want in your intro? say whatever you want, but keep it really short because they can look that up in the workbook, the handout. They're already in the audience. So they really, you know, maybe don't have a choice of, but you can build the next speaker up yep. and say whatever you want about him or her. But within 30 seconds, that intro is forgotten about. And people are looking at their watch, looking at the brochure of maybe there's another breakout I can run to, or the opposite. You could say, our, our next speaker is, I apologize, I don't remember his name, but but, but just give him a, a warm welcome. You're going to love him. <laughs> and, and within you know, less than three minutes, the bio and the accolades, are, are you know, maybe yeah. they, they get you there, right? Yeah. But, but they certainly, when you have them in the room, what you say and how you present it and the challenges and the assumptions, all the things your challenge or sale is, is going to make them forget about Wait, he was a three-time best-selling author or four-time, right? You know, you're right. It's, it's So the goal is great as a, as a speaker. And as, I have the same conversations like, 
well, I got this bio from your website. It's really long. How, what do you want me to say? Which part of this guy? And I said, just tell them who I am. Tell them what I got, the title of the presentation. Away we go. And in the, but the goal is if I'm engaging them and I'm saying interesting stuff, they'll look me up afterward. You know, so that's the lead too, right? Don't lead, like you're saying, don't lead with, because you haven't given them a reason to care about that. You know, give them the reason, which is the presentation, the insight, the value, the delivery. They'll look it up on the back end. You know, and that's the well, let's talk about that. You know, I want to make sure our listeners got it. So their proposal, their website, their collateral, what, what should it lead with? And, yeah. and I know you can't if it's specific, if we're customizing for that type of industry. What should it lead with? Yeah. So my what I recommend, in, whether it's a sales presentation or we're talking about content on your website or collateral, it should be leading with problems that are, first of all, relevant to the customer ideally provocative and surprising, right? It gets a way to stop. I mean, think about think about all the stuff like you and I see on Twitter or LinkedIn and you just scroll and you scroll and you scroll and you scroll. And then every once in a while, it's, oh, that's pretty interesting. You know, here's a company right. that found this or here's somebody who said that. Well, I'm going to expand on that. I'm going to read it. But think about like, what's the thing that pulls somebody into the sales funnel, right? And what is that context? That's what you should be leading with. Um, you should be leading to all the stuff about you. What makes you unique, your feeds and speeds, your features and benefits, your accolades, your, your, your reference clients, your case studies, your ROI calculator, that all, that all comes at the end. But you got to give the customer a reason to want to pay to spend time, I mean, it's on your website, spend time in the sales conversation, spend time on the Zoom call with the salesperson. And that has to be about a problem uh, that is relevant to the customer and ideally a problem that they either didn't know existed or maybe is way bigger than they thought it ever was, but it's it's surprising in some way. And getting that right is hard. You know, I don't want to make light of that, but coming up with those insights, those frame-breaking insights that really capture somebody's attention, grab them by the lapels and shake them, and that, that lead to your solution, getting that all right takes work. And in most companies, it's the job of marketing and product and sales leadership to come up with those stories. Smaller business, often the, um, the entrepreneur, the business owner who comes up with that, say, guys, we're going to lead with this insight. This insight that the Digitalist group has that's unique to us, and it ties exactly to the solution we're going to sell. Now, we're going to get a lot of pushback because this is something nobody else is saying out there. People are going to want to press, where'd you get that data to prove it, right? Make me believe it. Now, why should I care about it? Now, what would it mean? How would be the return on solving for it? Okay, tell me more about Digitalist group and what you guys can do. Like, that's the, that's the ideal construct. I love it. The challenger sale, taking control of the customer conversation. To me, it was a, a paradigm shift. I, I can't say enough. I applied this. I had everyone on the DeJulius group read it. I have all our licensed CX coaches read it for building their pipeline, but we use it in, in so many different facets of our business from marketing to how we you know, uh, consult to constantly making sure that we're defining that no one is smarter than us at what we do. In a way, when I was thinking about what we used to do, it was a little bit lazy, right? You need that. We do that. It's yeah. a perfect match, you know, and, and, and let me send you the link or whatever. But to really press back and ask that question, why do you think you need that? And to be willing to have. But I think if you are the expert, you, you, it's a confidence. It's not a cockiness to push back and say, you know, Matt, let me give you a, another way of looking at this. Yep. You know, never thought about it this way before. Right, yeah. right. I absolutely love it, Matt. And Matt has written several books. I'm, I'm, we're going to have the link in the show notes to uh, how you can get the challenger sale, taking control of the customer conversation, as well as how you can get a hold of Matt and follow him. Matt, tell me, you know, what you're doing now. Some sure, exciting yeah, um, changes in your world, I believe. Yeah, yeah. So I just uh, just started a new business with some um, uh, current and former colleagues. Uh, so guys I worked with at CEB in, uh, in research over the years. The company is called uh, DCM Insights. We call it a customer. It's the customer understanding lab. So we're, we're a research company. We're out there studying, changing customer behavior. Because remember, you know, we talked about challengers really response to the, the changing ways that customers are buying. Effortless experience, the response to the changing preferences and expectations customers have of the, the brands they do business with when it comes to customer service delivery. But we're out there, we're studying customers, and then we deliver our insights to customers, to our clients, in the form of assessments and diagnostics that are, that are data and research-based. We call it development experiences, but uh, sales training, training for frontline teams and call centers, et cetera, management teams, leadership teams, uh, and then also advisory sports. We do a lot of speaking, 
one-off consulting projects for companies. But again, our view is that it's it's all about growth through science. It really requires we put our conventional wisdom aside, put those long-held assumptions aside, no longer how no matter how long they've been in existence. And then we bring data and research and science to test those things. And we believe that that always leads us to a better path, a better, you know, Challenger is a great example of that. You know, what happens when you actually take research and data and apply it to a problem that I think a lot of people, like you said, John, a lot of people assume that's all about relationships. Let's be great relationship builders. When we study with data, you realize, well, that may have been true 20 years ago, but it's not true today. And how has this evolved? And when you have that, that's really powerful insight to go change the way that you engage the market. So that's what we're all about. And I'd encourage all your listeners to come, come check us out. Got yeah, we're going to put that link in. And Matt, you also have another exciting yes, news. Yes. You, uh, are, we're, you've just completed another book. Tell us about that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the new book is called The Jolt Effect. It comes out in September 2022. The subtitle is How High Performers Overcome Customer Indecision. And so in sales, B2B and B2C. So whether your listener is, hey, I run a large scale sales call center and travel and leisure or financial services. I know a lot of your clients are in that in that business, or it's a business business company that's selling solutions to business customers. What we find is that a huge percentage of customers who say they want to buy from you never end up buying. So in the range is somewhere between 40 and 60 percent, depends on the industry. We find in B2C, like so think about when you're calling up your insurance company or new, another insurance company or mobile provider to get a quote, about 60% of those callers call in and say, hey, I, I want to place an order. Can you tell me more about your data plan? Tell me more about your, you know, your life insurance policy, your homeowner's insurance, car insurance, whatever. And then they never end up buying anything from the representative. It'd be so they're just window through. shopping? Window shopping, yeah. That, but, but I think more specifically what's going on is they become indecisive, right? And okay. in B2B, it's about 40%. And this is a really tough thing to do because you think about what or deal with. If you think about what the average salesperson does in that situation. So imagine you're out there selling your services. Customer says, boy, you've convinced me. De Julius Group is the group we got to go with, right? All the other guys, we push them all out. We told them, no, we're working with you. We want to buy from you. But then 40% of the time in your business, B2B, 40% of those deals end up with the customer gets cold feet. They go dark. They go radio silent. They tell you, you know, priorities have changed. You know, they're, they're thinking about it. Or maybe they heard of an upstart competitor. Oh, John, you know, we definitely want to work with you. We've got to talk to these other guys first. Somebody yeah. mentioned that they're, you know, they're doing good work, whatever. So they get cold feet and then they end up in the, what we call land of no decision or indecision. Now, what we find is most salespeople, when they encounter that, they kind of go back to the well. So their assumption is the customer must not be buying because we haven't convinced them of the problem. We haven't taught them that the situation they have right now is bad enough, or we haven't shown them how much better we are than our competitors. So we haven't overcome the status quo, but we found in the research is that overcoming indecision requires a different playbook than overcoming the status quo. We spent the last hour talking about Challenger. Challenger is a way to overcome the status quo, but it is not really a a playbook for overcoming indecision. Indecision happens for different reasons. So a customer can look you in the eye and say, did Julius Group is the group we want to work with? And you have beaten the status quo. You have taught them that the other guys they're working with are no good. The, the homegrown training program they have, no good. You got to go with DJOS Group and they are in. They're sold. So you've gone from one of three possible competitors down to one of one. But getting to the dotted line still requires that you deal with a, a set of indecision drivers that are totally human. Stuff like, John, I, I just, I don't think we, you're asking us to spend a lot of money. I don't know if we've done enough homework yet. So send us some more case studies. Send us a, let me talk to a couple more reference clients. Let's just, you know, a new gardener study. Come, we'll read that first and then we'll, you know, we're going to put you off. We're going to do some more. We need to be an expert. The second one is, boy, John, you talked about all the stuff your Julius Group does and the different ways we could configure your solution. And we think we want to buy this one, but what if we should really be buying that one? Or that could be, you know, we, we shouldn't be just doing it in this call center. We should Maybe do it too many problems. options. Too many options, right? The old paradox of choice. And then the third one is, Boy, John, I love what you're talking about. I'm sold. And I, I talk to all your reference clients. Clients, they love you. I love your success stories and your case profiles. You get to do good work. Everyone swears by you. But what if we're the one client where this goes sideways and doesn't pay off? And that happens. It's my name on the contract and somebody's head's going to roll. So, you know, nobody gets fired for maintaining the status quo, but you do get fired for changing it and it goes sideways. So, so these are human things. It has nothing to do Matthew, with where money. does the flavor of the month shiny object come in that we need to do this? How fast can you start? And then they go radio silent because there's something else became the pressing issue. Well, good news. That that never happens in sales, right? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, that's a it's a it's a great question. I think some of that goes back to what we found high performers do when it comes to indecision is they actually disqualify. You mentioned disqualification before, and it's such an important 
high performer trade? How do we avoid chasing garbage trucks? How do I decide you are a client I want to sell to? Not just will you buy my solution, but I want to do business with you. I want my name associated with this project. I'm actually going to be able to get something done and done well with your organization. And so we know high performers will look at, so in your case, you guys probably have a good ideal customer profile. You know, you don't do well in certain industries. Other industries, it's like it's like run off, tackle left. We sell these guys all day and we kill it over here. But your salespeople know, hey, I'm, you know, if I, this company is in this industry. Maybe they're on this kind of system in their context center. Maybe they're, they use this methodology. It's not going to be a great fit for us. We don't have as much success there. So they'll disqualify those things. What we found is high performers will also disqualify based on the customer's ability to make productive decisions or, or non-dysfunctional decisions. So they're looking for the stuff that's not on paper, the demographics, if you will. They're looking for the stuff in the customer's head. Can you actually get from A to B? Can we get you there? And I think part of the problem is, how much is this a shiny penny for you, a flavor of the week, right? Let me pressure test how serious this is. And by the way, we're going to get bumped out because something else is going to come along and suddenly is the top priority, right? So so your high performers are looking for those signs of, of decision-making dysfunction. And even if it looks like a great fit customer, they may say, you know what? The way you're talking about this, I know it's a shiny penny. You're going on the back burner because something else, and I cannot afford to invest my scarce time in chasing this opportunity. So I think it's a great question. Again, I, I'd love to say- No, I love this topic, <laughs> Matt. The Jolt Effect coming out September. We're going to put a link in there. And I, I think I may have to bring you back on around that time to talk about that book. About yeah, that'd be great. I'd love to do it. Matt, I love it. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks so much for all the wealth of knowledge and expertise you've brought to me and, and so many listeners and readers. And your books are fantastic. You're a great guy. I have uh, the utmost respect for you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Feeling is, feeling is mutual, John. Thank you for inviting me. Great to see you and talk to you again after all these years. And uh, thank you for what you and your team do out in the market. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Revolutionaries, for another podcast of the Customer Service Revolution Podcast. We will see you next week. We love to read your reviews. Please be sure to share your comments and let us know what you're enjoying most on the podcast. And to hear more episodes, be sure to subscribe now on iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Thanks for listening and being part of the Customer Service Revolution. Revolution.